I want to do the the. Okay. All right. Uh, so the topic that has been given by Dr. Sunita Maheshwari is eco tech center. So I think all of you are pretty good at doing echoes. So I'm not really going to tell you how to do echo and what an echo looks like. But basically, I'm going to just tell you where all you can get trapped uh, while you are doing echoes. More so, you know, the common problems that we face and the common errors that we commit. So let's go further. Why it is not. Okay, there we are. So the the reasons for errors, one is of course the commonest would be lack of knowledge because many of us are not aware of certain abnormalities and therefore it is more like uh, we don't, we've never seen it, so therefore we, we, we don't know about it. It is also very rare. Uh, aspects of our, uh, you know, ignorance. One is that we know that we know, typical VSDs, ASDs and all that you see every day. We also are aware of certain things that we know that we do not know. So there'll be some abnormalities that we have never seen before. So we know they exist, but we've never seen their echo. So we really can't make out when we see it for the first time. But then there is a big group where we don't know that we don't know and we don't know that we actually know. So there will be, I'm not going to discuss under these headings, but this is how basically lack of knowledge uh, Shows. So here is a classical example is of a four chamber view of a patient who is looking like a large AST. But we all know that Bosa valve can produce uh, a little bit of uh, thinning of the septum and therefore like a dropout in four chamber view. So you are supposed to do a subcostal view to be very sure if there's an AST or not. And this is this is something that is much less committed. This error is much less committed now because you have uh, colored doctor to put it across. And obviously, you won't have any color doctor if you're doing it in this going across, although you see a defect. The other thing you need to look for is the dilatation of right atrium and right ventricle. Obviously, if there's such a large age, you expect right ventricular chambers to be right atrium and right ventricle to be dilated. Another common thing that we see is a uh, CRE network, which sometimes almost crosses the right atrium or almost divides it into uh, two parts. And, you know, these are the two examples that I'm showing you. But again, you are not going to see any turbulence across it. So you will see this uh, like a membrane, but you won't see any turbulence across the uh, membrane. If there is a real turbulence and if there is a real membrane, that is called port right atrium tester, something that very, very rare. So here is an example of a four chamber view where basically what you are seeing is large right atrium, large right ventricle. Left sided chambers look quite normal, if at all. The left ventricle looks a little smallish, but you really don't see much of atrial sacral defect over here. Although, again, it is an epical four chamber view, therefore, it should not be uh, taken to decide whether there is a dropout or not. So, the commonest cause of right ventricular dilation we all know are the ASDs. And I think secundum ASDs or so called fossa valis ASDs, primum ASDs, they're very, very easy to diagnose, both with 2D in a subcostal view as well as with color doppler. But what we often miss is the sinus venosus ASD. So whenever you have a dilated right atrium and dilated right ventricle, and the clinical diagnosis looks like uh, looks like ASD, you have to look for sinus venosus ASD. Sinus venosus ASD obviously will not be seen in the conventional four chamber, but sometimes in a subcostal view, especially in a child where the where the echo windows are good, you are able to see the dropout, and you will see that this sinus venosus ASD has no upper border. It is right at the top and sometimes you may have a pulmonary vein going anomalously right above the brain over to the right atrium or sometimes even superior vena cava may be straddling over the defect but on color you will definitely see this happening so remember there could be sinus process ASD with the pfo and therefore if you find a small pfo but you have ra and rb dilatation you have to look for something more than that because we all know that a small ASD or a pfo should not give rise to rb dilatation so many a times uh, the diagnosis is made as fossa ovalis ASD, but it is very small and one does not realize that there is another ASD right on the top, which is producing so much of right atrium and right ventricular dilatation. Many a time, especially if you have a bigger uh, patient, then you sometimes have to resort to transesophageal echo, which will show this pretty well in a, uh, in a bicable view. And here you will see that 
this part of the septum is also very thin, but there is really no defect. The defect is lying over here. It is possible if you do only subcostal view or vertical pore chamber view, this may appear like an AST because it may be like a dropout because it's very thin septum. So in older patients, when the windows are not very good, it's advisable to do their transesophageal echo and do a bicable view, which will show you the sinus venosus AST. This is another uh, child actually, or an infant, who also shows a right, large right HM and right ventricle, uh, normal left ventricle, and again, he's carrying a diagnosis of AST. And there is actually an ASD, which you will see later. But I think we all know that when somebody is presenting very early in life with congestive heart failure, then all ASDs have to be taken as TAPVCs, because that's another common differential diagnosis that we missed. So, People who are doing echoes but are not trained in congenital heart may just diagnose that an ASD, but if the patient is in distress, if there is congestive heart failure, respiratory distress, then we need to think about TAPVC. And this is precisely what this child has. I think the clue comes from the fact that there's a right to left front at the ASD and not left to right. You always expect a left to right front at the ASD level. So there is a right to left front. So this patient clearly has ASD, which is not very large, and the shunt is right to left. So if it is a small child, the first thing you need to think about is TAPVC. Often TAPVC is unobstructed. Only in obstructed TAPVC we know present very, very early in life, in the first few months of life. And if you have an older child or an older infant, then perhaps it's going to be non-obstructed. There could still be pulmonary arterial hypertension because of a large flow. But you can see it's a supra-cardiac TAPVC, which is non-obstructed. This is the vertical vein on the left side. So so-called figure of eight, as we call it. So dilated, uh, left vertical vein, dilated, left denominate vein dilated to superior vein activity, they all suggestive of TAPVC and of course along with uh, right to left front at the AST level. Sometimes we are lucky and the X-ray shows so-called typical uh, figure of eight appearance. So whenever you are diagnosing AST, more so in a small child, look for uh, X-ray chest also, don't ignore. You can see that if I have just gone one slide back for uh, uh, aortic 
large ALT with mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis. And I was just trying to tell you that you can, you're likely to miss mitral stenosis if you just go by pressure of time because pressure of time will not show any gradient and everything will look fine. But actually, if you if you uh, see the planning matrix, then you're going to pick it up. So this patient actually had, uh, it's about, I think, 12 or 13 year old girl who had large ASD came in heart failure, was in sinusism, and the cause for heart failure was mitral disease. So this was like a lutein partial complex. So this was ASD with mitral stenosis. Now, what I was uh, trying to tell uh, last time when the audio went over was that uh, whenever you have a child who is having severe pulmonary arterial hypertension and you are you're not seeing an obvious cause for it, you need to really consider many differential diagnoses. And that's a common problem that we face in clinical practice that uh, you have right atrium, right ventricle dilatation, you have significant records to regurgitation, there is no VST, there is no PDA, obvious, and therefore you wonder why this pulmonary artery hypertension is happening. And many a times these children are labeled as primary pulmonary artery hypertension. I think whenever we are dealing with PAH in children, we must we must uh, think of many conditions which are actually treatable. And before saying, telling anybody that this is primary pulmonary artery hypertension, we need to think of many possibilities. Some of them I'm going to show you. So you have to consider age of the child. If it's a very small baby, it is likely to be obstructive TAPVC and it is very, very unlikely to be uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. Similarly, if the child is in distress and in heart failure, likelihood is that you're dealing with a shunt uh, kind of a thing which you're missing because it's a very odd shunt. And of course, the features we have to see, what are the other factors, other features present on echocardiography. So this is a five-day-old baby who has presented in heart failure, has evidence of severe pulmonary arterial hypertension, right atrium, right ventricle dilated. And obviously, there is no cause on echocardiography. Everything looks fine. There is no VSD. There is nothing. There is an ASD, which is going right to left, suggestive of severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. And what you get peculiarly is that there is a you know, aortic runoff, as you can see here. So there is an aortic runoff, but there is no aortic regurgitation. There is no PDA to, to uh, as a cause of this aortic runoff. So when you have such a small baby who is in distress, you have to think of some very, very odd conditions. And one of them is a vein of gallon malformation, which is uh, not an uncommon entity. I think if you, if you keep your ears and eyes open, you would probably see one case every year or at least every two years. And what is important is that we should not ignore clinical uh, examination. And whenever you have a patient where everything looks fine, but patient has features of severe pH, and it's a very small baby, usually within first week of life, you must try and hear over the head. Because when there is an AB malformation, you can actually get a continuous murmur or a brewing over the head of this baby. And it is very easy to hear because these babies have all these continents, continents open. So you can actually hear it, and you can sometimes do a head ultrasound, and that might also give you an idea that there is a vein of gallon malformation. Of course, angiography is the, the final diagnosis. Similarly, this is another eight-month-old child who is presenting with, again, pulmonary artery hypertension and is in heart failure. Echo showing same, dilated right atrium, dilated right ventricle with moderate precursor regurgitation and evidence of severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. So you again try and see, and again you can see that there is a runoff in aorta. So there is no PDA, but there is a runoff in aorta. So what is happening over here? Actually, this child is having right pulmonary artery rising from aorta. Or some people like to call it hemitrunkus, but actually it's better to call it anomalous right pulmonary artery from the ascending aorta. So when you do an angiogram, you only fill left pulmonary artery. Right pulmonary artery is not seen because it is disconnected from pulmonary artery. So again, whenever you have a patient who shows right ventricular dilatation, with tricuspid regurgitation, with severe pH, in the short axis, you must look for bifurcation of pulmonary artery. Otherwise, you are always going to miss this condition of so-called hemitruncus or anomalous RPA from aorta. So this may be absolutely an isolated entity, and the treatment is clearly doable. You can surgically correct this child. Therefore, it's important to diagnose this particular entity, and you have to look for bifurcation of pulmonary artery in short axis. This is another patient, again, severe pulmonary artery hypertension, right atrium, right ventricle dilatation, and if you see very clear, carefully, then you will see you will see a, a ridge of tissue above the, just above the mitral valve in the left atrium. So this is actually supramitral ring, and I think, of course, Doppler will give you the diagnosis, but something like cold right atrium can also give you a similar kind of diagnosis. So the causes of treatable pulmonary artery hypertension, besides, of course, vein of gallon malformation and uh, hemitruncus, you have to think of left ventricular inflow obstructions, whether in the form of cold right atrium or in the form of supramitral ring or sometimes even pulmonary venous stenosis. So unexplained 
pulmonary artery hypertension, you have to look for these conditions before labeling anybody as primary PA because these are all absolutely treatable causes of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, I'll just show you another example. This is actually an 18-year-old girl who had a large VST and we did a contrast echo and we found that she has got a, you know, right to left hand, so she's actually like a nice and syndrome. So we thought, okay, this girl, nothing can be done. But when we looked clearly, uh, more carefully at her echo, you will see that one of the pulmonary veins over here is actually showing turbulent flow. And in fact, there was a gradient of as much as 10 to 12 millimeters of mercury, which is a really significant gradient across this pulmonary vein. So she underwent a pulmonary vein dilatation and her PA pressures came down. I don't know if she'll ever become operable for VST, but definitely this problem of pulmonary vein stenosis was contributing to her pulmonary artery hypertension as well as to her symptoms because pulmonary venous hypertension was also there and that was producing dyspnea in her. So at least symptomatically, she will be better once she will look after this pulmonary vein. So this was VST with pulmonary vein stenosis. This is a four-month-old uh, patient who recently I saw who also had features of severe pulmonary artery hypertension and came with a diagnosis uh, outside of supracardiac KP. BC. So we said, yes, everything looks fine. The ASD is going right to left, and this is the supracardiac PAPVC. But what was catching my eye was that his left ventricle, it's not very well seen here, but his left ventricle looked really full. There is a dilatation of RA and RB, but left ventricle is not banana shaped as you expect in PAPVC. This LV was looking full. So I said, there has to be something more than this, than, than just PAPVC. And you will see that this child actually, because we looked for it, this child actually had a large AP window. You know, such a large AP window. And then obviously this condition would have would have been missed because we had already diagnosed APVC and we would have said this is what he has and he could have gone for surgery. But I think just to see that the left ventricle is not looking very small, left ventricle is full, we have to look for some uh, obvious shunt. PD is very, very likely possibility, but he did not have a PD and he actually had a large AP window. So you can have a combination of defects which, you know, sometimes we ignore. We see one and we say, okay, everything can be explained by this, so let us uh, uh, let us make a diagnosis. But one must remember even subtle features uh, could give you could give you a clue towards one of the rare diagnoses. So this was actually the APPC with a large AP window. Now we all know that pulmonary artery pressure can be estimated by tricuspid regurgitation velocity. Some people like to uh, do it with. I mean, earlier we used to do with pulmonary uh, Doppler, spectral Doppler. PDA can also give you an idea of the PA pressure. Similarly, BSCs can also give BSC signal can also give you an idea of PA pressure. So there are various ways to diagnose pulmonary artery hypertension. But I just want to highlight that. Whenever you see these features, especially in tricuspid regurgitation or a VSD velocity, that actually tells you the RV pressure. It does not tell you PA pressure. So there has to be uh, whether you should make it as PA pressure because PA pressure is often equal to RV systolic pressure, but not always. So you can have conditions where there is very high systemic pressure. You have a gradient of uh, 60 or 64 across VSD, and you say this VSD is small, but it is possible that the, that the systemic pressure because the coarctation or anything may be actually 120 or 140, and then obviously the PA pressures are high. Similarly, when there is an LB to RA shunt, we often pick that up and call it pulmonary artery hypertension, but actually it is not pulmonary artery hypertension because this is LB to RA, which will always be high velocity. Similarly, there is pulmonary stenosis, if there is aortic stenosis, these will not give you right PA pressure. And I have seen this happening because in ASD, especially in ASD, I have seen that there is some amount of TR and you pick a velocity of 40, 45, and then the patient has mild to moderate hy pulmonary hypertension. That is not true because there is always a gradient across the pulmonary valve in ASD. So if there is a gradient of 20, 25 because of flow, then obviously the PA pressure is actually 20, 25 only, which is normal. So these KVs one has to remember whenever we are estimating pulmonary artery pressure by echo Doppler. If you have a patient with, let us say, chronic constrictive pericarditis, his RA pressure may be 20. And if you get a velocity of only, let us say, uh, 2.5, then you will say, okay, RV systolic pressure is 25 plus RA pressure, there is no pulmonary artery hypertension. But if RA pressure is 20, then obviously RV pressure is 45, which is same as PA pressure, and therefore there's going to be pulmonary arterial hypertension. So whenever we are estimating pulmonary artery pressure by echo doctor, we need to keep these caveats in mind, and that is the reason why I showed you this slide. Now we'll go to another group of patients. This is a young patient who is presenting with severe, severely dilated left ventricle, and we tend to write these patients as dilated cardiomyopathy. Like I said, for pulmonary artery hypertension, for dilated cardiomyopathy, also there is a whole checklist 
which must be excluded before labeling some, somebody as DCM. Because once you label somebody as DCM, like primary PH, you have given up on this patient. You think that this patient just needs supportive care and there is no other treatment for this patient. So we need to ru rule out coronary anomalies. LCAP, of course, you all know is the commonest thing, but then there could be sometimes right coronary artery anomaly. And we've had some patients with right coronary artery anomaly producing ventricular dysfunction. Then you could also be dealing with some of these obstructive lesions which are so obstructive that they produce LV dilatation, but the gradients are not much because the cardiac output has reduced. Another condition that we often miss is arthritis, And uh, I think uh, we've seen many patients who do not even have hypertension when they come because their LV is so bad that their hypertension gets decapitated. So they have a pressure of 100, 110, and therefore we don't diagnose hypertension. But they present in pulmonary edema. The classical example being renal artery stenosis because of aortoarthritis, something which is not uncommon in our country. And aortoarthritis can also produce obstructive lesion in the thoracic aorta or abdominal aorta, like coagulation or middle aortic syndrome. And that will also produce LV dilatation. Then I think hypocalcemia, vitamin D3 deficiency, and another important list, uh, and another important diagnosis in this list is tachycardiomyopathy, especially persistent tachycardia, whether because of ectopic atrial tachycardia or PJRD, can over a period of time produce dilated poor uh, ventricle, and that could uh, look like ventricle or peripheral cardiomyopathy. So this is, I think all of you are familiar with this condition. This is a patient who had airway dysfunction, but had anomalous coronary artery, from the pulmonary artery, and I think it's quite uh, the clue comes from the fact that there's dilated right coronary artery, and then of course the left left coronary left coronary artery. If you see it is coming from pulmonary artery. Sometimes it could be false negative. It may appear as if it is coming from aorta, but what you have to see is the flow. So look at the flow pattern in the circumflex. This is circumflex. That is LAD. The flow pattern in the circumflex is actually red. That means the blood is coming like this. Normally, if it was coming from aorta, this would have been blue and this would have been red. It's exactly opposite. So this also suggests that there is a reversal of flow in the coronary artery. Again, highly suggestible anomalous left coronary artery from pulmonary artery. I think it's also important to remember that many of these LCAPA patients may, especially those presenting later in life at um, 10 years, 15 years or so, may not have such poor LV. They may actually have more like mitral regurgitation. So please remember that whenever a patient has mitral regurgitation and there is no cause for it, of course, rheumatic heart disease is very common in our country, but if you think it is not rheumatic heart disease, then you again should rule out anomalous left coronary artery from pulmonary artery. And I think the, common, the most important flow comes from the ECG, something that we tend to ignore. We don't even do their ECG sometimes. But just look at you know such deep Q waves in lead one and ABS. So there's still often infarct pattern. So if you have an infarct pattern on the ECG, even if your echo shows normal coronary artery pattern, I think it is important to rule out alcohol because we know both false positive as well as false negative can happen on echocardiography. And dilatation of right coronary artery is also a little bit of a clue towards alcohol. I'll also show you another example, a 12-year-old female who presenting in emergency in cardiac failure. All pressure pulses are pretty weak. She's quite in distress. She's in pulmonary edema, heart rate is 140, blood pressure is 110 over 75. She's been diagnosed as dilatory cardiomyopathy just a week ago outside, and she has a very short duration of illness. Now, obviously, the first thing that comes to our mind is that she has a dilatory cardiomyopathy or a myocarditis, which has deteriorated to dilatory cardiomyopathy, and you try and look at the echo of the LVs dilated, it is poorly contracting, you try to rule out aortic stenosis, there is no aortic stenosis, there is no coagulation of aorta, and all pulses are weak. But then you must always do some postural view, and you will see that there is an obstruction in the aorta, which is descending thoracic aorta, very close to the diaphragm, and that is highly, highly suggestive of something called aortoarthritis, or non-specific aortoarthritis, or some people also call it Takayasu disease. So, Finding no obstruction over here does not mean that she cannot have obstruction lower down. And lower down obstruction is not because of coagulation, it is because of aortoarthritis, especially because this is a girl who was 12 years. So we found that her renal arteries were also involved, and she actually went into pulmonary edema because of renal artery stenosis, and that is called flash pulmonary edema. And that is how she presented. Now, it's important to understand and important to diagnose because a majority of these cases can actually be helped with an intervention, whether it is balloon dilatation or stenting of the renal arteries and aorta. Even from the supposed view, you're going to get this kind of a signal suggestive of obstruction in the aorta. 
And of course, she did show a little bit of hypertension when she got stabilized with all the therapy that we give it. And then we realized, I think it's important to understand that dilated cardiomyopathy patients should not, or it's unlikely to have a patient, uh, unlikely to have a pressure which is in the uh, high normal or hypertensive range. And whenever you have a little bit of hypertension also, you must think of your arthritis and renal artery stenosis. This patient actually, this is the DSA that we did, uh, I think, almost an emergency patient, and we found that she has both renal artery as well as the involvement of the aorta, and she underwent dilatation, and she quite was helped with that. This ECG I'm just showing you to uh, to uh, show you that ECG has a lot of value in uh, patients who present with dilated cardiomyopathy, like picture. Because this patient, you know, if you see this alone, it looks everything looks fine. There is a P wave, there's a QRS, so each QRS is preceded by a P wave, so it looks like a sinus rhythm. I think the odd point is that her PR is pretty prolonged at a heart rate of 150, her PR is almost reaching 180 milliseconds, which is odd because at a heart rate of 200 or 150, you must have a shorter PR. And this is what happened to her when she got converted. Now, this is very nice sinus rhythm, and you can see the heart rate has come down to almost 100. So, this was actually a PGR, an ectopic atrial tachycardia, which got converted with medicine to normal sinusism. And obviously, her LV, which was very distressed over here, started improving. This is another patient who, again, a younger patient, I think an infant who came with dilated cardiomyopathy like picture. And the obvious thing was that she had a very long QT interval. And when we did her calcium, it came down to be quite low. So actually, this was a hypocalcemic. And I think now we are all very, very sensitized to vitamin D deficiency, T3 deficiency, as well as uh, hypocalcemia as a cause of dilated cardiomyopathy or a reversible dilated cardiomyopathy. So small babies, infants, young children, I think you need to think about it. So the checklist again, Alcapa, Alcapa, which I showed you, obstructive uh, lesions, autoarthritis, deficiency, take the one. Just to tell you that anybody with a dilated poorly contracting LV should not be labeled as dilated cardiomyopathy because there are lots of treatable conditions that can reverse this problem. Now, then I will just show you some pattern recognition. Now, this is a patient who was, who was referred to us from outside as PDA with aortic stenosis and a bicuspid aortic valve. Yes, we did find a PDA on echocardiography. And here there is aortic stenosis. You will see that there is a turbulence across the aortic valve, but his aortic valve was not bicuspid. bicuspid. It was actually aortic stenosis because of a subaortic membrane. And I think unless you really think about it, you probably will miss it because there's no, or there's very little aortic regurgitation. This is the membrane which is close to the aortic valve, and it is important because if it is valvular AS, you can go ahead and dilate, you can close the PD in the lab, the device, but if it is a bike, if it is a subaortic membrane, then in all, in all probability, this patient will need surgery for removal of or resection of the membrane. So, this is a pattern. Whenever you have a patient of PDA who has an associated aortic stenosis, it is very likely that it will be a subaortic membrane and not a bicuspid. Of course, bicuspid aortic valve is common, it can happen, but you must look for subaortic membrane. So, this is a pattern or this is an association that we often don't realize. Similarly, this is a patient who came to us with a diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, an eight or nine month old child, massively dilated, massively hypertrophic ventricle, dilated. There was no LVOT obstruction, and he was diagnosed as HCM outside. And uh, that was the diagnosis. LV, you can see, is functioning quite normally, but the patient was in gross heart failure because there was a lot of diastolic dysfunction of the LV. And I think the clue came from here. The ECG shows very, very tall QRS complexes, suggestive of marked ventricular hypertrophy. And look at the PR. The PR interval is so short. With this large complexes and a short PR, you have to think of something called glycogen storage disease, common as being pompase disease. So we labeled him as pompase disease, and we got the enzyme assay done, and actually it turned out to be positive. So these are just the patterns that you have to recognize. I think it also shows the importance of doing ancillary investigations like ECG, X-ray test. It also shows you the fact that you need to be very, very careful when you are doing an echo. You should not miss membrane with a valvular snow and things like that. This is another pattern that we need to understand. Whenever somebody comes with really hypertrophic ventricles, you need to think of glycogen storage disease, especially in small babies or infants, because that is where they present most of the time. This is another interesting case, a preterm baby, 30 weeks, very, very small, diagnosed to have a PPHN, primary pulmonary hypertension um, of the newborn. Echo initially was done as normal. On day three, he developed hypertension and repeat echo was requested. And 
this baby was actually on a high frequency oscillometer and uh, you know we saw these uh, little little dots that you will see on in, on ivs over here the lv cavity which was showing you know acoustic shadowing this is actually here so bronchovenous fistula had occurred which is described in neonates occasionally it is time in neonates due to ventilation injuries when this, these are put on high uh, frequency ventilator. So there was a ventricular dysfunction as well as you could see actually air inside the heart. And you wonder how the air has come and we've not done anything. So this was because of the high frequency oscillometer induced injury. This is uh, a patient of uh, again presenting to us with severe aortic regurgitation that he was only nine months old. There was no bicuspid aortic valve. He had very long adidastolic murmur. He showed a lot of features of AR. But this is really not here. This was actually LB2 aorta tunnel. And again, you have to look very carefully because the aortic valve is lying over here. And above the aortic valve, we had this extra shadow from where the blood was leaking back into the LB. So this was actually an LB2 aorta tunnel. Again, an important thing to diagnose because for an LB aorta tunnel, your your uh, your uh, index for sending in for surgery on your uh, you know, he should go for surgery as soon as he can. But if it is really aortic regurgitation, then you are really hesitant to send for surgery because you know that the surgeon cannot replace a valve at this stage. He can do a cross operation or he can do an aortic valve repair. And the results may not be good. But if it is LV2 aorta tunnel, then the results are really good because you are not doing anything to the valve. Valve is fine. It is all that you have to close the tunnel and the AR stops. So aorta LV tunnel is something again which must which presents as severe aortic regurgitation. Now, I'll just show you a couple of uh, unusual pathologies. Now, this, of course, is very, very uh, clear that this LV is so poor that if you have a mass inside, we should call it a crotch because this LV is very prone to a crotch. So, therefore, this is not a difficult diagnosis. The DCM with a clot is, is not unusual. Now, this one, this one was uh, another one where the left ventricle looked normal, but this was a non compression of the actually right ventricle. So you see that the right ventricle is dilated, right ventricle is dysfunctional, tricuspid valve is not closing very well, there was a lot of TR, and you can see some pericardial effusion, and this was a non compression right ventricle, unusual, but it's well described. This is another child who underwent a surgery for VLD, and you see this big ball coming from the uh, IVC and then getting through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. And we didn't know what it is. Then we were told by the surgeons that they had put in a line over here, and it's possible that this clot actually formed over the line, and this was like acting like a ball. So of course, he was put on anticoagulation, and he gradually broke the ball, became smaller, but it was always very scary that it'll just, you know, break from here and get into the lung. So sometimes we think, we also sent him for surgery, but then we said, let's wait for some time, and he, fortunately, he improved. This was uh, a hydrated cyst actually, a mass which was appearing like to be in the heart, but is actually not in the heart. It is in the pericardium, as you will see here. This is the left ventricle location, and we confirmed that on CT. In fact, this case has been reported a uh, huge hydrated cyst of the pericardium. This is another child. who had a big mass in the right ventricle. He presented with a lot of tachycardia and, and we didn't know what is happening. So we investigated him and we found that there was some evidence of uh, tubercle. Maybe so simply the antitubercular and you can see that with antitubercular his mass has become so much smaller. It's still there, but it's clearly much less than what it was. This was, I think, three or four months later. So this was nothing but tuberculosis and we didn't really have to get him operated. On the other hand, we had this child who was an 11-year-old, a huge mass in the right ventricle, almost fulfilling the entire right ventricle. Again, we didn't know what is happening, but this patient was hemodynamically unstable because there was obstruction to the tricuspid valve because of this mass and we had to get him operated and we actually got him on the table and we uh, this excise the mass was excised and then the frozen section was done and we realized it was actually a pleomorphic uh, sarcoma of the right ventricle. So this was a malignant tumor and uh, we ultimately lost this child. This is another big mass in the right atrium, very big mass and which was actually tumor process. So again this fellow was also treated with antitumoral therapy. So sometimes masses in the ventricle may be tumors but sometimes they could be just infected especially in a setting of our country, we have to rule out a lot of infective etiologies uh, in the heart. 
So just to conclude, I think uh, AST uh, with pulmonary artery hypertension, please don't take it as simple ASD. You have to rule out other conditions, whether it is mitral disease or it is CAPDC or it is associated with AP window or a large PDA. Also, of course, sinus nose of the ASD must be ruled out. If you have RV, RA dilatation, but you don't see the ASD, you may have to go for a TE and RC to be helpful. Similarly, BSD, a bicuspid muscular BSD may be missed, and sometimes uh, they are not very big, but they are important for the surgeon to, to know. Then we have PDA, PDA is associated coaptation and associated subaortic membrane, tetralogy of pallos, additional VST to be ruled out, uh, coronaries to be seen if possible, much more. And then we have dilated cardiomyopathy where we need to rule out L-kappa, R-kappa, coaptation, aorto arteritis, aortic nose, I have shown you some examples. So a diagnosis of DCM and a diagnosis of pulmonary artery hypertension must be diagnosed with exclusion because there are various reasons for these, and these need to be excluded before labeling somebody as having no uh, treatment. Because once you say idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension, then there is no treatment. And of course, you should be familiar with some rare and uncommon analysis. Thank you. I would be happy to take.